The mission statement of our church is finding direction by following Jesus, so it is right for us to consider what that means. Beginning February 18th and lasting till Easter, we pastors will offer a Lenten sermon series titled Following. As we observe the season of Lent, a time to consider and confess our sins, let us remember those in the Bible who were faithful in their following, though not always perfect. We also will recall some who followed Jesus only to abandon him, betray him, or persecute him. Join us as we embark on a spiritual journey through Scripture to explore the various paths we tread as followers of Christ. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My oldest daughter, Paige, is married to Anch Mother and is getting married to Anch Mother. She and Anch will exchange vows in May in India over three days. The family agreed that we could only afford one big wedding, so last Sunday a small Christian wedding was held in our living room with in-person attendance of only immediate family and a few others that we put to work. Alice Lofton was there. She decorated the mantle. Beautiful. Go on my Facebook page to see it. It's beautiful. The Link family was there. Elizabeth filmed the ceremony. Chris was the groom's valet. And Eleanor was a flower girl intern. And Sarah and Jen were there, two of Paige's friends. They were the photographers and bride's attendants. Sarah and Jen became friends the very first day that they met as freshmen at Presbyterian College. And they invited a few other girls they connected with to join them in Sarah's room every night for a debriefing of the day as they got to know each other and got to know the college. Paige was not one of those invited. But there she was the very first night, and I imagine someone asking, what, what is Paige doing here? That's her name, right? And then she was there the next night, and the next night she was there again, and the night after that. You see, they didn't know that Paige belonged in that group, but Paige knew that she belonged in that group, and they just needed to catch up. That group of freshman gals and a few guys later adopted into the group have remained fast friends to this day. I love that story, and I love Paige's friends, so I'm glad I have an opportunity to tell it, because in the passage that I'm about to read, I'm going to speak of someone who decided that she belonged, even though others might have not have thought so at first. Listen for God's voice as I read Mark 5, 25-34. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately. Her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How could you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The word of the Lord. The ultimate question of this passage is who belongs with Jesus? Though it's a different question, I want to begin by asking, who belongs in a church? Who belongs in a faith community? That's not the same question 
as asking who belongs with Jesus. They are related questions, but not the same question. For instance, I did not belong at the church Millie and I first attended when we were in graduate school. There was nothing wrong with the church. It was a good church. It had a good minister. It had great outreach in the community. And it was walking distance from our schools. But the minister's style of preaching and my style of listening did not jive. He might have had wonderful content in his sermons, but I would never know it. He had this sing-song delivery that went up and down, gently rocking me to sleep. You understand, don't you, that I usually was up late on Saturday nights, studying, of course. It got to the point where I couldn't even make it past the scripture reading when he read it. Fortunately, I didn't snore then as I do now, and Millie didn't have to jab me in the ribs. You see, sermons really matter to me. They're an important reason why I go to church. So we eventually switched to another wonderful church pastored by someone who worked here and helped begin the Presbyterian Community Center, Ben Sparks, and it was a better fit. When people look for a church to attend, maybe to join, maybe to become involved in, they look for a good fit. I mean, some people go to church where they want to find a church where they can feel something or find a closer connection to God. Some want a church to build a better moral foundation, especially for their children. Some hope going to church will make them a better person and they want to find a church that helps them be a better person. And some go to church that will give them comfort in troubling times. By the way, I didn't come up with those four reasons off the top of my head, but rather those are the four top reasons off a list provided by the Pew Foundation from a study it did in 2018. I have two other reasons that I wish had cracked the top four, powerful worship and the church's outreach, but that's about me. That's beside the point. The point is that there are many worthy reasons to find a church and people want to find one that fits them. And it all has to do with belonging. I'm not talking membership here, but being a part of something, being part of a community. And we have to respect that. There are people who have visited here and joined elsewhere, and we can only be happy that they found a good church home. But what about those people who want a congregation to be a good fit? but they think that there's something about them that might exclude them if it were known. I am talking specifically about those things that we wouldn't necessarily see as a violation of the gospel. Many of us think that churches were wrong to exclude people from our fellowship because of race or sexual orientation or social status or political affiliation. But what about those people who just don't want to be fully seen. Sure, it might be because of some mistake or wrong of the past, a violation of trust in a relationship, a marriage, a, a criminal record, things once said and done that caused real harm to other people. But it could also be about something that's not wrong, but something they fear would make them unacceptable and not fit in. Want some easy examples? I'll give a few, but don't judge people for any of them. I have sympathy with all of these. Some will stay away because they are sick and they don't want to infect others. Who could fault them for that? I have known folks who have stayed away from church worship simply because they didn't want to be seen having to use a walker or a wheelchair. Now, of course, we want people not to worry about that, but Give them some space. How about those who don't want to be exposed for how little Bible and theology they know? Plenty of people feel this way, but they won't say it. They won't say it until a preacher calls them and asks them to serve on the session. And the preacher hears the first question they ask, will there be an exam? <laughs> Which is to say that if you feel that way, believe me, you're not surrounded by nothing but Bible scholars and theologians. 
And though I said earlier that political affiliation should not be a reason for exclusion, it's becoming increasingly true that as churches become increasingly polarized, there are more and more members afraid to admit to others how they vote. It's a thing. When people are saying, well, you can't be Republican or you can't be Democrat and be Christian. Uh, Not here, not with me, not with you, I hope. But it's a thing. Every faith community, like every other human community I can think of, has people within it that want to hide something about themselves because if it were known, it might make it seem like they don't really belong. They don't really fit. And if you give just three or four thoughts to the subject and think about things like confidentiality and social norms and what's going on in the world, you'll realize that while this can be unnecessary sometimes, this can also be wise and prudent at other times. But having said that, I do love it when someone who is different decides that they belong and the community just has to deal with it. I think Millie smiled earlier when I told the story in the first service because it's a good memory we share. At my last church that I served, over 26 years ago, a wonderful, accepting church, there was a young adult who had an intellectual disability who began attending. Now, this isn't a perfect illustration because actually that church was great at including and accepting. They felt called particularly to people like this person. But nevertheless, human beings are human beings and people act like they act. And this particular person spoke a little too loudly when he spoke to anyone, and he talked to everyone he came in touch with. He would yell out, buddy, no matter who you are. And if he heard that there was a concern in your family, maybe something was said in concerns, he'd come up and give you a hug, even if he barely knew you. Now, like I said, that church was called to make space for people like that, but nevertheless, he took some getting used to, and sometimes visitors needed debriefing. But nevertheless, after not that long a time, people came to accept him for who he was, and they began to look forward to seeing him. And it became common for people to yell back, buddy, just as loud as he would yell it. And his compassion, which he showed so easily, became something that was healing. Our passage from Mark is about someone like that, someone who hadn't done anything wrong but still has something about her that would make other people think perhaps that she doesn't belong, at least not there. I understand the situation of the woman who has a chronic problem with hemorrhaging better having read what Frances Taylor Ginch has to say about her. In a man's world, even menstruation is something that few guys want to talk about and deal with, and these crowds tend to be mostly men. Just look in the Gospels. There were 5,000 people there, also women and children. (laughs) But that's not her problem. Menstruation's not her problem. She has something chronically wrong. The issue here is not a shameful sin that needs to be forgiven, but an unclean situation that needs purifying and an unwell situation that needs healing. If you don't see the difference in what I'm saying, just remember when we ask good, innocent people to keep their distance and not touch each other for two years. But if this problem is not dealt with, this woman's life is over. We know that she once had means because she once went to physicians to help her. But while they drained her resources, her situation has only grown worse. She would easily, by the way, receive compassion from most of those who were in the crowd that day. Many would help with food. They would help with money, knowing her situation. But maybe they would prefer to leave food at her door and not have to come in the house. Ginch helped me understand that we can't be too harsh with the crowd. Like many Christian preachers in the past, um, one could easily quote Leviticus 15 and point out how purity laws forbid anyone to sleep in the bed that she sleeps in or sit in the chair that she sits in. 
But historically, these extreme purity rules were really followed by strict priests and Pharisees and the Orthodox devout who were both rigorous and literal, probably until they had the same problem themselves. But you know, people don't act that way. I mean, if Emory is sick, we're keeping her home, but I am going to hug her. Among family, among friends, and within the community, there is plenty of bending of the rules then as now. But still in Jesus' day, and really in our day, her problem is not something that most people would want others to know about. And if they find out, and if they are uncomfortable enough, somebody could even make an issue of it by calling on the manual and quoting Leviticus 15. This woman can't live without going out and encountering others and living her life, but just having to hide her condition is itself isolating. But this woman with the flow of blood joins in this crowd, and she follows Jesus, and she jostles just like everyone else, trying to get close to him and touch his cloak because she believes that Jesus has something to offer her that those physicians did not and she believes that she should have access to it. That she belongs there. Many in the crowd would not invite her to join in the procession if they knew, but there she is. And that is what makes her remarkable in Jesus' eyes. Just to emphasize how remarkable this is, understand this. Jesus did not invite her either. He didn't even know she was there. This is the only miracle involving Jesus in the Gospels that's not initiated by Jesus himself. The writer of the Gospel of Matthew can't accept this. He changes the story. He says that after the woman touches the hem of his garment, he turns and sees her, and then out of his own initiative, he heals her. But in Mark, the original story, the woman is healed even before Jesus sees her. He feels the power that heals her go out from him, and then he turns and asks, who touched me? Let's pause and admire the beauty of what's right there in front of us. This passage is the perfect setting for the jewel of a truth that we all need to keep hearing over and over again. This woman is healed because she has faith that she belongs even with her condition. Her entire culture pushes her to keep her distance, but she doesn't even need Jesus to make a ruling as to whether she could come near. She already knows it. Who says she can follow Jesus? Not the crowd. Not even Jesus, who doesn't even know that she's there. She follows Jesus because she gets it. She gets what makes it possible for any of us to follow Jesus, no matter how worthy we think we are. What she gets is grace. She knows that despite what anyone says, even those quoting those verses in Leviticus, that she has a place in Jesus' company. It's not because she is well or unwell, acceptable or unacceptable, guilty or innocent, clean or unclean. It is because God's grace, which welcomes others, welcomes her. And Jesus makes that clear when he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. The woman's embrace of grace is the faith that has saved her, which, by the way, is a better translation than made you well. I have to back up here. When Jesus turns and asks, who touched me? The disciples are incredulous because in this crowd, there are at least hundreds of answers to that question. But there is something about her. Ginch points out that he uses an explicitly feminine participle. In other words, Jesus is looking specifically for the woman who touched him. In a crowd of mostly men, in a culture asking that space be maintained between genders, he wants to know where that woman is. 
And that is an incredibly vulnerable moment. You've seen the athlete, haven't you, if you watch a lot of basketball games, giving high fives as it goes through the tunnel or as she goes through the tunnel to get out, but then stops to address one person, and you know in that moment you watch because you're wondering, is this good or is this bad? Did he see a friend or has someone insulted her? What woman has touched me? You can see how that could go either way. The passage says that the woman trembles. The woman who so shamelessly and courageously fought her way through a jostling crowd to touch Jesus now trembles with fear that she might have overstepped and she falls down before him. And right there in that vulnerable moment, feeling so vulnerable for Jesus, we see her remarkable faith because it's in humility before God that we find our strength before others. And the passage says that she tells him everything. The woman who had good reason to not be forthcoming about her issues tells Jesus everything because she trusts that nothing about her disqualifies her from being in his company. And Jesus' response is extraordinary. First, I don't know, I don't always do this, please, but he draws her need out into the public, letting everybody know that she belongs and that her faith is to be admired. And second, he doesn't take credit for what happens. He does not present himself as the male hero of this woman in peril. He gives her credit for following him, for touching him, for for taking responsibility, for taking action for her own best interest, for her own health. She was bold in assuming that she belongs in the crowd of followers. And Jesus wants the followers to know she's right. Good for her. Oh, and good for you and me. Even for those of us who others would say, Of course she belongs. She grew up in that church. Or of course he belongs. He's an elder. He's always doing good things for other people. The truth is that all of us have this secret. None of us have achieved the right to be in the presence of God. None of us have earned the right to follow Jesus. We belong for a reason that's no better and no worse than the reason the woman feels she belongs. Grace allows us to be here. I have been one fortunate pastor in that I have served three churches that understand that grace, not worthiness, is what makes us belong. Remember how I said that belonging in a church and belonging with Jesus are not the same? Asking who belongs are related questions, but the lists may not be the same that there are understandable reasons why some people would feel more comfortable in this family of faith rather than that family of faith, because on this side of death, that's the way it's always going to be with human communities. But when a church truly understands at its core that the only reason any of us belong with Jesus is because of grace, that's when a church finds it easier to widen its welcome. Because grace brought us in, we celebrate grace bringing others in. And it becomes easier to celebrate the new, interesting, and different people who become a part of us because their stories become fresh stories about the most important story we have to tell, the story about God's grace. How much easier it is for insiders to welcome others for who they are when insiders realize that the only reason we are inside is because grace brought us in. Second Presbyterian, finding direction by following Jesus.